Chafee College, Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art, Home Edition, Artist Talk, Jody Cavalier, April 14, 2021 from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us at today's program featuring artist and educator Jody Cavalier, presented as part of the Wignall Museum's Home Edition. Home Edition is a series of curated artist talks, workshops, and discussions featuring artists and cultural workers. My name is Rebecca Traywick, and I serve as the director and curator of the Wignall Museum at Chafee College. The Wignall Museum is a teaching museum and interdisciplinary art space that introduces Chafee College students, faculty, staff, and community members to innovative contemporary art objects and ideas. By fostering critical thinking, visual literacy, discourse, and empathy, the museum seeks to enhance the intellectual and cultural life of our community. We want to take a moment to recognize that we are situated on the Rancho Cucamonga campus of Chafee College, which resides on the traditional and unceded lands of the Tongva people. We offer our recognition and respect to the elders, both past, present, and future. And hello, my name is Roman Stallenwork. I am assistant curator at the Wignall Museum. Please visit us at www.chafee.edu slash Wignall to access our full schedule of programs and available recordings. When possible, recordings are made available on our website. Announcements post to our email subscribers and social media when new videos are available. You can follow us on social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Wignall Museum. Visit our website About Us page to sign up to receive email announcements. And we also ask that you complete a brief survey after the session at tinyurl.com slash Wignall Spring 21 Visitor Survey. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Andy Hadel. I am the preparator at the museum. I'll be assisting Rebecca and Roman with today's Zoom session. In a moment, Jody Cavalier will present for about a half an hour or so, with the remaining time being available for Q&A. Thanks, Roman and Andy. Today, I have the honor of introducing our guest artist, Jody Cavalier. Jody is a project-based artist working with residuals of daily life, objects, food, and language. Cavalier earned her BA from the University of California, Berkeley, and MFA from Pacific Northwest College of Art, Portland, Oregon. Cavalier has participated in residencies, including the Center for Land Use Interpretation, Passaic, AZ West Wagon Encampment, and Anka. Her work has been exhibited at museums across the Pacific Northwest and California, Chicago, New York, and Frankfurt. Jody grew up in the Inland Empire and is a graduate of Chafee College. She participated in the Student Invitational Honors course and exhibition in 2008. We're thrilled to have Jody return to the college virtually to share about her studio practice. So please join me in giving Jody a warm virtual welcome to Home Edition. Welcome, Jody, and thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to be back here uh, at Chafee. Uh, it feels really full circle for me. Um, I really thought a lot about the type of work I wanted to share um, when Rebecca asked me to do this. And I make a lot of different types of things. and have been working on a lot of different types of projects, but I really, I, I really kept coming back to thinking about language as a type of material and thinking about some of the projects that I had really been focusing on and still working on and um, thinking about this last year and how it has shifted our lives and how these moments um, are really fleeting. Everything is kind of fleeting. And even before we let folks into uh, this presentation room, we were talking about time and, and how time is uh, very much a construct and, and how we are following a different type of time um, uh, now. Uh, and so I, I'm really thinking about um, my artwork that I'm about to show you as, as being the kind of eph ephemeral kind of qualities um, at place. And then also um, the, the artwork itself is the intangible moments. 
And so there's going to be a lot of text and I'll read some of that. And there's going to be um, uh, some work that is a little bit hard to categorize. I wanted to start out with this first image because this is actually uh, one of the, the works that uh, reconnected Rebecca and I. This piece was supposed to be in a show uh, right before uh, the pandemic hit the US and closure started to happen. Um, the exhibition kind of got postponed and inevitably kind of uh, canceled or, or we don't know, we don't know what, but um, this piece was a, a real turning point for me in my practice. It uh, was one of the pieces that overtly addressed uh, my interest in food, uh, food justice, and um, my cultural heritage, and then also um, a, a more traditional kind of art practice. So I was able to create this work um, while I was in residency at uh, a place in Portland called the Working Library, where I was able to learn uh, letterpress printing. And so this is part of an edition of hand, hand letterpress prints. And um, title, I want food. And, and the, the language itself came actually pretty naturally and all at once. Uh, it was included in a small zine. And there was a point in which I realized it was a lot more powerful than, um, than I initially uh, expected uh, when I put it in the zine. And I wanted to kind of take that out and let it have its own life. And so I, I made this, this print, which is kind of uh, stylized to be a, a kind of wanted uh, poster format. Um, but then, um, you know, through this repetition of language um, and, and somewhat uh, of humor, you start to, to really understand the complexities of, of what is being said, which is that uh, it's it's more than just about food and eating. It's it's about life. It's about um, healing. It's about uh, so many other things in our life. Um, and so after this piece, I was I was really leaning into using language a lot more and using uh, a a kind of more direct poetic, I guess, in my work. Um, I was always interested in a kind of poetic approach in my art making, but uh, never really using language in this way. Um, and so I really, like I said, leaned into that and, um, and started to make uh, more of this type of work. So <clears throat> this is one of many pieces um, that are, are essentially menus. And so I collaborated with an artist here in Portland um, who is actually one of my graduate advisors. Her name is MK Guth. And we worked on a series of uh, menus. And so we wanted to take clues and, and cues from r restaurant and dining experiences um, and use those in the work. And that was kind of the starting point. And so we made a series of these menus and, and this one in particular um, is one of my favorites of the series. Um, I was thinking about it being a kind of like Gothic style, uh, maybe so something that you would see in a funeral home with across between like a, a fancy steakhouse or something. And so I, I was really like grabbing these different kinds of, of inspirations um, and, and created this piece. Um, it's called Preservation. And uh, I, I was thinking about a kind of preservation of self um, through loss and uh, the kind of transformation that happens, um, but also thinking about food more directly and um, was researching a lot of 
of methods of, of preserving food. And so um, uh, there's a transformation that definitely happens there too, where, where the food almost uh, uh, can almost go rotten and then, and then turn and, and be preserved in this way. So the text uh, itself uh, on the right side that you see, um, I'll read that. It's broken up into courses, um, again, to mimic that kind of menu. Um, so there's a first course, second course, third course, and then a suite. Um, and it says, uh, I have nothing against life. I watch as time has bruised the flesh. Taste it go odd, never dead, but resurrected. Nothing is stronger than what rises up from the ashes. And so again, thinking about the different ways um, that even just the term preservation can mean and uh, also subversing it, you know, similarly with the, the first piece, like thinking about uh, the repetition of I want food, I want food. And then at a certain point, as you're reading through it, 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 it kind of changes. Um, and this piece uh, was part of a, a project, like I said, that was a collaboration. Uh, we, we created these menus. They were exhibited pretty traditionally in a, in a gallery. Um, there were some dining tables, which you could grab the menu and, and kind of spend more time with it. But they also, the gallery gave us an opportunity to um, have a dinner, basically. Um, to host a dinner. And so uh, in true fashion, um, my collaborator and I wanted to complicate uh, this dinner process. And so um, we secured an, an offsite location um, and we wanted to think about, again, breaking apart uh, uh, what the dining experience is and uh, we decided that we wanted to have a multi-course dinner, but each course would be at a different site on this, on this old camp property. And so we moved with our dinner guests to each different location and had a bite to eat and then ended up all in, in one location at the end for the, the main course. Sits around a fire. And so this piece... Um, uh, like I said, there was a, a text that was kind of read at each site and then a little bite of food and then they were kind of related and we talked um, about those things before moving on to the next one. Um, I wanted to read, <coughs> excuse me, an excerpt um, from that project. Uh, I suppose I'll read two excerpts, but we'll start off with what this one. So. This is a, a kind of zoomed in map of the property. And then there's an image on the left there of, of me um, in the middle of reciting um, what I will share with you now. But um, this particular spot in, in the project, um, I'm talking about water. And so we were thinking about, about the elements that were present in this location. So, um, I'll read you a, a short excerpt from, from this uh, particular uh, section. Uh, there are two creeks that run through this property. They are known today as Bee Creek and Canyon Creek. They intersect over there. The water that fills this small lake is from Bee Creek. At one time, there were a number of native salmon fish that made their home in this creek. They are no longer there. Maybe they will return. Maybe something else will take their place. The creeks keep moving and they are never still. Close your eyes. I like to imagine those fish as ghosts, and if those ghost fish were light, this whole lake would glow 
and illuminate everything in the dark, everything down there in the water and everything around us up here in the air. We would see everything differently. Imagine seeing everything differently than how we see it now. You can open your eyes. A group of people sit on wooden benches arranged in a semicircle in a forest. A woman stands in front of the group of people holding a clipboard and resting on a table. Uh, this is another site on the property. Um, and this particular location, I was, uh, I was really drawn to, well, the name of this location on the property is called Cedar Circle. And there's a bunch of cedar trees that, that kind of make this uh, opening um, in this kind of really lush and densely populated with trees um, area. And so I knew that I wanted to, uh, to write about the trees in some fashion. And at that time, I was also doing a lot of research on Mexican healing practices. And so um, it really was a, a, a kind of nice moment where I could uh, insert some of my research and also talk about the actual kind of ingredient or, um, or material that, that was present, like or surrounding us. And so I'll, I'll read you um, an excerpt from, from, this, from this particular location. Um, and then this is, is the last I'll share of this project, but um, it definitely starts to uh, feed into a, a lot of the other projects. All right. Cedar bark was once used in the production of rope, mats, and basketry, often combined with other elements of the cedar, such as limbs, roots, bows, used for strength or decoration. In the past, cedar bark was the main material used in the production of clothing for the Stolo people in British Columbia and other tribes in the Pacific Northwest, which is where this took place, which is where I, I live. After the bark was peeled into long strips from the trees, the outer layer was split away and the flexible inner layer was shredded and processed. The resulting felted strips of bark were soft and could be sewn or woven into a variety of fabrics. <coughs> Excuse me. My great aunt practiced Mexican healing methods. She passed away a, a few years ago. There's an ailment in Mexican culture that's not easily translated into English. Susto is what it's called. It's something you can see in a person and maybe have felt, but there's no language, no words to fully describe it. It's not recognized in Western medicine. Suso is a loss of spirit, a loss of soul, a magical fright, a trauma. The children held in detention centers at the border. They can't remember their own mothers. This is Susto. A ritual using cedar is used to help cure susto. Bark and branches are gathered to make a broom. The cedar broom is used on the body as if to sweep the susto away from the surface. The cedar tree is generous. May we learn from the generosity of these kinds of trees. Jody stands at the front of a classroom with two young girls on each side of her. People viewing Jody and the two girls stand and sit on the floor. So this next project, um, I was invited to meet the curatorial committee um, at a, a middle school uh, here in Portland. And uh, it's, a, it's a project, a social practice project, uh, a contemporary art museum housed inside the middle school and it's called Kea Smoka. Uh, King School Museum of Contemporary Art. And the curatorial committee is made up of um, 
fourth graders and fifth graders, I think. Um, and the, the group invited me in with their um, advisor, Ross Cruz, who's pictured here in the kind of center of the image. And uh, I show them a bunch of my work and, and they decide one, if, if they're gonna show my work um, in their school, in their museum, <coughs> excuse me, and two, which of the works they might want to show. So we met on um, a Thursday, which is uh, pizza day um, in the cafeteria. And he, we all got our pizzas and, and went back to um, the room and, and kind of were looking at my work. And I was talking about, um, about the work I was making. And, and in particular, um, a, a lot of the work uh, that was you know, more print-based, um, and then some of the work that was around these Mexican rituals that I, I was researching at the time. And so they were really drawn to, to these rituals and, and had all kinds of um, experiences of their own to share about family rituals and, and different things that, um, that, that they would do uh, in their own culture. And, and they were really jazzed about um, me bringing in these series of, of hand brooms. Um, and so they, they knew they wanted to, to have that be part of the piece. And so in, instead, of, uh, instead of just having them select works and me and installing these pieces, I decided that maybe we should collaborate on the piece together. <clears throat> and so that's what we did for a series of um, a couple of months. Uh, I went to the school on, on piece of Thursdays and, and we met and we talked about the work that we were, we were making together. So it started out from, from the broom itself and the idea of this ritual. And I, I asked the students, um, you know, what were the things that kind of ailed them or, or what were the things that worried them? And, and they began to share those experiences with me and, and those things that they were thinking about. And, um, and I, I used that text to create this, this line drawing that, that referenced the broom. And so what you see next to the broom are, are two prints, uh, one you know, framed more traditionally and the other one in this, um, this kind of uh, spiral bound um, format where students could rip off a copy of of the print and take it home if they wanted to. So they, they were really interested in the kind of interactive qualities of my work. So I wanted to make sure that those were also present and included. And so, um, so the, the text itself has, uh, like I said, the responses to their questions, you know, what, what worries them? So they were talking about um, really, intense subject matter, actually. Um, family members getting sick, friends moving away, um, doing good in school. Um, they talked about gun violence and mass shootings in schools and, and all, all types of things that, um, that, you know, we might not think children are, are processing um, but, but they were readily available to, to talk about and share. And so um, it was a really wonderful and powerful piece um, that, that we worked on together. Here's um, a kind of closer up of the takeaway print. So you can see the text that, that turns into the line drawn. And, and they helped me choose the colors and and all of that as well. Very collaborative. Text, what worries you? 2019, take a print. <clears throat> so I have um, just a couple more um, things to share. Um, right before the pandemic uh, hit, I was taking a, a self-publishing 
uh, course and um, getting ready to publish a book of, of poetry and images and um, and I'm going to read a, a kind of excerpt from, from that. Um, it's a project that I haven't continued to work on yet. Um, I hope to, but um, my process is very long. And uh, this past year has been particularly challenging on my creative practice. And I haven't been able to, uh, I guess more in what's what's happening in the world and in my life, and uh, I think once that happens, I might be able to work and, and kind of process more um, through some some projects I have in mind. Um, I have lots of projects that just kind of stopped, um, but here is um, one um, <clears throat> that again uh, I include you. I intend to include in, in the publication, but I also am using um, as a, a kind of ex experimental presentation or like a, a per, in a performative way, which is why you see um, this lovely image of, of water. <clears throat> All right. I have a project I can't get out of my head. I think about it all of the time, but the real issue is that it refuses to move from my head to paper and from paper back to the earth. It's a hill in the middle of the ocean, my nephew says. It has water, or it has flowers and animals on it. The project is about islands or a specific island, I'm not sure. How do I even write about an island? And why do I even care? I grew up in the Mojave Desert, flat, dry land as far as you can see, and as far as you can possibly imagine. The only water I saw were mirages. Can you see it? Do you see it too, my sister would say, as she knocked her fist against my arm. An optical phenomenon in which light rays bend to produce a displaced image of distant objects or the sky. The word comes from Merari, meaning to look at, to wonder. This is the same root as for mirror and to admire. My grandmother is an island. I look at her from here, from my body, with admiration. My grandfather says, I know your grandmother is not well. She repeats things all the time. But I just got to go with the flow, Miha. I just got to go with the flow. My grandmother is an island, the water washing away her memory. My grandmother, my grandmother is an island. Ocean water ebbs and flows back and forth. Title, waiting for. Um, and then this is the last piece I'll show. It It is a piece I made this past year. Uh, the same gallery who um, invited me to work with my collaborator on those series of menus <clears throat> commissioned me to uh, revisit this piece that was um, a, ver a version of one of the menus from before, but I... Uh, I made a different kind of version of it um, that really kind of referenced um, my life in that moment in, in mid-pandemic um, 
uh, almost about this time last year. And so it has that same kind of repeating quality. It's called waiting for, um, and and it 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 always starts with waiting for, waiting for something to happen, waiting for time to hold still, waiting for water to boil, waiting for the words to lose meaning, waiting for memories to fade, waiting for things to blow over, waiting to work again, waiting for wisdom, waiting for the struggle to end. And it goes on and on and on. And it's this combination of, of really mundane things that happen in our lives, like waiting for the laundry to dry, uh, bumped up against things that are really happening um, in, in that moment, waiting for the election, waiting you know, for these moments of peace, um, you know, especially during a time um, with so much upheaval and, and uh, you know, Portland being one of the, the city centers of, um, of resistance uh, in the country. And so there were just, you know, there was so much happening that it was hard not to get, uh, have, you know, these mundane things in your life get butt up against um, very, very serious uh, things as well. So uh, this was a, a kind of piece um, that reflected that. And that's what I have for you. Thanks for bearing with me and recovering from a sinus uh, infection. Thank you, Jody. Um, I knew you were an artist who uses language and text, but now I see you're also a poet and writer. Um, so thank you. A menu for waiting is so poignant in these times, um, particularly. So thank you so much. Yeah. Rebecca Trawick. So I loved that you talked about the KS MOCA program. I'm a huge fan of that program and love that the, the students, uh, you know, they do all the work themselves. They, they consist of the curatorial committee, committee and I just think it's brilliant. Um, so I love that you were able to collaborate with them. And I love that you talked about, you know, that you really approached it as a collaboration a collaboration is one of the one of these things that seems really mysterious and kind of magical to people. <laughs> uh, and so rarely do I hear discussions about what collaborations look like, what what it means, what it constitutes um, a successful collaboration. So maybe you could talk about how you approach collaborations and you could use chaos mocha as the the you know sort of test case or talk about any of the collaborations that you've done. Yeah. Um... That's a hard one. I think um, uh, I can say coming from maybe um, a pretty large family that um, that definitely uh, that's my nephew Taki. Um, um, that definitely has has affected the way I think about collaboration. I I, I think. Um, so much about art making is authorship and with collaboration I think you have to let a lot of that authorship go and you have to uh, think about the the collaboration at least for me I, I can speak to my own collaborate collaboration and experiences but for me collaboration is more um, about that relationship than it is about the outcome and so when I keep thinking about that and prioritizing that, then um, it helps me make decisions about what is, is best for, for that particular situation. Every collaboration is different and then working with youth is, is very different than um, working and collaborating with adults. Um, so um, yeah, with the, the KS Mocha crew, you know, they had been working with artists for a while and um, having KS Mocha be in their school for quite some time. And so they were already used to what relationships look like um, with artists um, from the outside. And so, um, you know, I just leaned into, into what they were wanting and thinking and, um, and, and that helped drive it. And they were, you know, 
eager and open to, to uh, hear what I had to say, but also um, um, had their own ideas as well. And so for me, it, it's just, uh, you know, the, with Kea Smoka also, I, I just feel really grateful that they invited me in. Uh, it's such a well-known project across the country. And um, even though there, there's seemingly a lot at stake, it also didn't feel like that. You know, it felt really comfortable and it felt like we could do whatever we wanted to do because um, they were always, you know, pushing up against the kind of rules. And so um, we just kind of went with it. Andrew Hadel. So you um, you grew up in Inland Empire and you're a, an alumni of JP College. So I'm, I'm wondering if you have any advice for students who might be interested in a career in the arts or have or, or looking for um, or just have a you know a future in the arts in general I wonder if you had any uh, advice for them uh, it's funny because we were talking before folks entered the the room but I was saying that um, you know initially I wanted to go to culinary school before I went to college and um, didn't go down that path, but then while I was in school, I, I studied so many different things because I really didn't see a way that I could be an artist at, and, and maintain like a, a career doing that. Like I, I always knew that I would make art, but I didn't think that I could have a, a career doing that. Um, and, and I was saying, I didn't feel pressured by anyone. I just had that kind of thought in my head um, and I kept taking art classes anyway, and I took a lot of other courses, uh, which um, is the reason I think so much of, of my work is interdisciplinary because it, it is influenced by, you know, psychology and sociology and all these other classes that I took over the years. Um, and so, my advice this is like a long winded response, but I guess my advice is that, um, you know, if you're, if you're continuing to take art classes, even though you, you don't think you, you maybe you felt similarly, you, you didn't think that it was possible to have a career. Um, you gotta maybe listen to yourself a little bit more and, and pursue that. But um, it isn't easy, obviously. Um, and I had plenty of great faculty over the years give me statistics about, you know, about how many artists don't make it. Um, um, and so, you know, the way that you can become successful is, is just continuing to make, talking to your faculty, uh, really developing relationships with with your teachers and, and they're your community. Um, and then being really engaged in any kind of other clubs or um, collectives or any, any other extracurricular things that you can be a part of um, because it's less hard when you're doing it together, when you're sharing resources um, as, as I think a lot of folks have experienced this past year, you know, it, it takes, um, it takes working together. It, it takes a village to, to make things happen. And, um, and that's, that's how I was able to kind of navigate through, um, school and, um, starting an art practice and, and kind of really seeing it through. And it's also a lifelong thing. Um, I think so many folks are eager to be successful um, at every kind of step of the way and, and that's not realistic and that's how you burn out. Um, I think of my art practice as a, a lifelong practice and you know, there's these moments that are punctuated where I have these great opportunities 
and work with some amazing artists and get shown or or whatever but um but there's still a lot of life left <laughs> and so um i'm not i'm not so worried or i try not to get worried about um who gets more attention um who's a younger artist with more accolades or or what have you um i can only you know worry about myself and and do what i can do we've got a question from evelyn what does your creative process look like do you have a very specific way to go about ideas or projects my process is very research based um, i start with um, a set of ideas or concerns and and really will go down a rabbit hole of just kind of um, researching and, and um, you know, messing with, if it's a material or, or if there's a material that's related to the idea, then I, I might um, experiment with that. But, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of it is kind of wandering <laughs> for a long period of time. Um, I do, spend a lot of time just thinking, which uh, took me a long time to, to get used to or um, to even be able to admit. Um, you know, I would spend time in the studio just like sitting on a, a couch, just kind of staring blankly off and, and trying to make sense of things in my head um, where maybe other people might be sketching or something like that. But I, I'm really thinking about how um, I can envision uh, a certain set of ideas um, being communicated. Um, I, I also think a lot about <clears throat> how the, the work communicates to non-artists. Um, and I think that that influences a lot of the work that I um, make as well. <coughs> um, so a lot of sitting around and doing nothing for a long time before, um, before I start to see kind of um, some of the things come together. I, I also usually like to do a kind of, uh, I guess what you would maybe think of like as a mind map and start to like group some of the ideas and materials together on paper and then start to see how um, that, that might uh, move things forward. Uh, one, once I get into production, it, it's usually really fast. Um, and, and that's um, because I have spent so much time already thinking about what, what it is I want to say and what materials I want to use. Speaking about materials, uh, a question from Kimberly in the chat. Um, do you have an overall media preference or process that has been your favorite to work with? I do love sculpture. I didn't show any sculpture really in, in this presentation, um, I think that part of that is just using your hands and in, in, in building and in, in, um, I, I do love that. But um, I don't think I have like a, a preference necessarily. <clears throat> a lot of the projects include a variety of, of media. And so um, I'm able to like kind of pick and choose um, things that I think are, are communicating um, the message. Um, more, more recently, I, I've been working with printmaking, um, which I do enjoy. I enjoy the process of printmaking. Um, but I, I also think some of that had to do with the fact that there was a period of time where um, I didn't have a, an artist studio. And so, I was working and went to work at a print shop. And so um, that kind of influenced the work that I was making because I had access to a, a print shop. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to enjoy all of the things that I, I work with um, and for every project it kind of just, it, it switches up. Um, I really think about, you know, what what is it, you know, that that the project 
um, like for just going back to the KS Mocha that had, you know, multiple interactive qualities started out with the broom. I knew I wanted to include the broom because the students were so drawn to it and they wanted to include the broom. <coughs> and then so much of what we were doing was just talking. You know, we were just, uh, me and the youth were just having conversations about art, about, um, about different cultural healing practices and, and um, superstitions and, and different things. And so I, I knew that, that there had to be a sort of storytelling element. And so language just became like the way to do that. And so then that led to printmaking. And so I, I really just kind of like try to go back to the original idea and see what serves it. So you talked about the value of research in your practice, it's sort of like the early stages, right? So research, experimentation, which all requires time, right? Um, can you talk about, I mean, you've had a, you've had some really amazing residencies. Can you talk about how residencies fit into your practice and that research phase potentially? I have had the opportunity to have some pretty cool residencies. Um, <clears throat> I would say it took me some time to figure out how to use residencies to my advantage. Um, the first couple residencies I went on, I, you know, overpacked and brought all these materials and had all these ideas and thought I was going to like make certain set of things. And, and then, um, I realized now, and, and unless I have like a project or a deadline I'm working on, um, I usually don't bring that much anymore. And really it for me is about the place that I'm going to and, and really like being open and listening to that space and, and seeing if there's any crossover into the things I'm already interested in or thinking about. And um, it allows me it allows me the time to kind of um, see that work or, or those ideas from a different perspective. And so um, I think that that's, that's one of the main ways that the residencies have functioned for me. And, um, and then, you know, I, I think about the location itself and what it has to offer. So uh, the last residency I did was in February of last year, um, I went to Brighton, England actually, and, um, and shot a lot of footage of the water there. Uh, my, re my studio was actually on um, a large barge that was kind of parked in, in the, um, in the, on the dock um, there and so I knew that residency was going to be very like water centered. And so I was, I was thinking about, um, about that. And, you know, I shot a lot of footage and I wasn't sure what I was going to do with it, but it keeps creeping up in these different ways. Um, and so I, I do revisit some of that, you know, when I did the residency um, in Joshua Tree at AZ West, <coughs> You know, I'm familiar with the desert because I grew up there. You know, that site is not far from where um, I grew up. And, you know, I knew that the, the sun was going to be one of the elements that was just going to be, you know, beating down on us. And so I took, um, I took a lot of materials that, um, where I could make cyanotype prints, um, similar to the ones behind me here, um, and using the sun to, to develop these like really archaic kind of um, photography prints um, while I was out there. And so, um, yeah, I'll usually bring like one kind of element or like think about one element that that place has to offer, the landscape has to offer and kind of um, have that, you know, in my back pocket, but really use the time and space to, to think about what, what's there and um, and how that place can make me think about my ideas differently. And then of course, connection to 
other people. I mean, that's a huge part of residencies as well, is making connections with, with the other residents, with the people who are running the place and, and all of that. Is there anything that you're reading, watching, looking at, you know, artists' work who is really inspiring you? Like what, what's giving you, what's inspiring you and in sort of getting you through this difficult pandemic world we live in? I've been reading a lot of Ocean Viong's work, po poet. Um, it's quite sad, <laughs> um, but uh, I do uh, enjoy reading his work. Um, I, I'm trying to get back into writing. So I think that a lot of, of what I'm reading is poetry right now. Um, uh, Tommy Pico's work also um, is, is really great. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, I, ju I, I just listen to a lot of music also. And so um, that, that also helps me kind of get through things and, and uh, try to get moving a little bit in the studio. We had another question pop up in the chat from Matt, the chat. How has living, how has living in the Pacific Northwest influenced your work? I'm sure it's influenced my work a ton. <laughs> I, um, you know, one of the early opportunities I got for a residency was to go to Utah um, for the land, um, uh, Center for Land Use Interpretation. And, you know, growing up, I always wanted to just like leave the desert. And I just, you know, it was just such a, you know, rural like wasteland to me in my mind, like growing up there. And um, when I did that residency, I, uh, it was a different type of desert. It was very harsh and uh, it's in the middle of nowhere. And um, I gained a new appreciation for the desert. And so I guess, you know, the more time I spend away from the place I grew up, um, the more appreciation I have um, for the landscape itself when I, when I go visit, you know. I find myself like taking photos of you know, the epic sunsets there or, or what have you, you know, there, there's just so much to appreciate um, that I didn't see, you know, growing up and, you know, an angsty, you know, kid there when I was. Yeah, where you grow up, it stays with you, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> A huge thanks to you, Jody, for your generosity today. Um, it was great to see a little bit of your practice and we appreciate your time and energy. So thanks so much. And thanks to all of you who spent a little bit of your afternoon with us. We appreciate you. Thanks everybody. And we hope you take good care and we'll see you next time. Text, Chafee College, Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art, Home Edition, 